Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will look at one example of a complex behavior that has been quite important in our understanding of animal learning, how animals learn to navigate mazes. Mazes have been used to study how animals learn about space and spatial navigation, but also to explore more generally how animals learn a complex skill. The study of maze learning was quite popular until about 1950 while later on, studies of learning in the standard Skinner box became more common. One reason is that the Skinner box saves the time and space for the experimenter by making it possible to run learning experiments in a fully automated way and in a small space. But the results of maze experiments are fascinating, and we can still look at experiments performed almost 100 years ago and learn from them. What is most interesting to us is that maze experiments were used to argue for or against two views of animal intelligence. Some researchers saw animals as a simple stimulus response machines. We discussed in our lessons Do Animals Imagine the Future that a stimulus response animal only performs rather simple learning without really thinking much about what it is doing. Other researchers believe that animals do much more complex thinking and attempted to use maze learning to show that animals can form a mental picture of the maze and use it flexibly during maze navigation. The main researcher associated with the idea that animals use mental models is Edward Chase Tolman. Tolman called mental models cognitive maps, and he thought animals and humans were not that different in how they learn and use them. For example, this is a map drawn by someone about a month after moving to a new city. The map includes some salient features like the person's home, a castle, a hill, meadows, and an iPhone store. When a person draws a map like this, we know that they can use it to find their way around. For example, if you are at a castle, you will know how to get to the iPhone store. In fact, you can look up the names on the map and discover that this is a pretty good approximation of a city of Edinburgh in Scotland. I'm talking about this map in some detail to give you an idea of what it means to say that an animal uses a cognitive map of its environment. We are essentially saying that the animal has a mental representation of the environment that it can use to find its way around. Based on the results of maze experiments, Tolmans and others were persuaded that animals do, in fact, have these cognitive maps. For example, in this video we see a puppy who wants to reach the owner and finds the most direct route blocked by laundry basket. After a few frustrated attempts, the puppy goes around the obstacle through a different route. A proponent of cognitive maps would say that the puppy knows the map of the apartment and can figure out an alternative way to reach the owner. Here we will see the puppy going to his right and reach the owner through another door. There he goes. On the other hand, a skeptic could say that the dog, having lived in the apartment for some time, had probably already used the alternative route to reach the owner. It did not figure it out on the spot, as the idea of the cognitive map would suggest, but had been already rewarded for traveling that route, and it had learned it by trial and error, like any normal instrumental learning. Throughout the decades, many researchers have been skeptical of cognitive maps in animals. When it comes to maze experiments, there was a lively discussion among psychologists until about 1960. But in psychology textbooks and popular science venues, one finds little of this discussion, and it looks like it has been demonstrated convincingly that animals use cognitive maps. Many researchers, on the other hand, including myself, are still skeptical and think that the evidence is quite ambiguous on this point, and that simpler explanations of the animal's behavior work as well or even better than cognitive maps. You can find some references to this work at the end of the lesson. Let's see now one experiment that Tolman and his co-worker Honzik used to argue for cognitive maps in rats, and how that experiment can also be interpreted differently. Tolman and Honzik put together a complex maze of 14 elementary mazes, as you can see in the image. Each smaller maze was shaped like a T, and I call it the elementary maze because it puts the rat in front of a single choice, whether to turn left or right. One choice led to the next T maze, the other led to a dead end. If the rat got all 14 choices right, it ended up at the end of the maze where it could find food. To make it easier to see, I drew the correct route through the map as a black continuous line. 
the correct sequence of left and right turns was irregular, so that the rats could not rely on a simple rule like always going right or alternating between left and right. Tolman and Honzik also put curtains in the maze so that the rats could not just see where the dead ends were. The curtains are drawn as dashed lines in the image. As I mentioned, the purpose of the experiment was to see if rats would learn the route to the food by just learning a road series of turns, or rather by learning a mental map of the maze. To do this, Tolman and Honzik included three groups of rats in their experiment, each trained in two phases. Let's go through each group in turn. Rats in the first group always found food at the end of the maze, and for them there was no difference between the two training phases. This graph shows the average number of wrong turns over successive days. As you can see, the rats made fewer and fewer errors as training proceeded. This tells us that the rats are capable of solving the problem, but it does not tell us how they do it. So Tolman and Honzik introduced two more groups of rats. One of them never found food in the maze and was used as a control group. As you can see, these rats did not learn to go to the food quickly. This is not surprising because they had no incentive to go there. The fact that we label some of their choices errors is just to compare this group with the other groups, but from this rat's point of view there was no right and no wrong choice. The third group of rats is the most interesting one. These rats explored the maze without any food reward for 10 days, after which they could find food at the end. And here is what the rats in this group did, displayed as the blue line. During the first 10 days they behaved exactly as the second group, as we would expect because neither group found food in the maze at this point. But when, on the 11th day, they started to find food at the end of the maze, these rats behaved dramatically different from the second group. They appeared to learn overnight and became even better than the first group that had been rewarded with food all along. Tolman and Onzik's conclusion was that the rats had learned a mental map of the maze during the first 10 days and then used it to come up immediately with the route to the food when this was introduced. This interpretation has been criticized a number of times. Robert Jensen's provided what I find a particularly insightful critique a few years ago. You can find the reference at the end of the lesson. Jensen noticed that the correct route in the maze was also the longest route that the rat could travel without bumping into dead ends. Jensen argued that a hungry rat that is looking for food does not like to find dead ends and it will learn to avoid them once it learns that there is nothing there. So, according to Jensen, Tolman and Honzik had accidentally set up a situation in which rats would prefer to travel the correct route because it had no dead ends, even if there was no food in the maze. To support his argument, Jensen noted that all groups initially improved in the maze, as you can see during the first few days, even the rats that were not finding food in the maze. Because an error is the same as finding a dead end, we can see that the rats are in fact learning to avoid the dead ends. This means that once they find food at the end of the maze, there is little learning left to do for the rats in the third group, and we see a sharp drop in the number of errors. But this does not mean, according to this interpretation, that the rats were using a mental map to find the solution. It just means that these rats were already traveling mostly the correct route and they just need to do the last little bit of learning with the motivation of the food that has now appeared to start running the maze very quickly. Let's now look at another experiment, this time by Spence and Lippitt. These authors argue that if rats can learn a map of a complex maze like the one used by Tolman and Honzik, they should also be able to learn a very simple maze. Accordingly, they set up an experiment where the rats had to make a single choice between left and right. The experiment had two groups of rats, and each group was trained in two phases. In the first phase, all rats were thirsty but not hungry, and could find water by going left. This is indicated in the design table by left to water and left to water for both groups of rats. Rats in group F, which stands for food, could also find food if they went right. So right pizza for these rats and right nothing for the other rats. But rats in group F had been pre-fed before the experiment so they were not at all hungry and in fact they didn't even try to eat the food. As this graph shows, all rats quickly learned to go to the water. Nothing surprising here. 
The interesting part of the experiment is that at this point Spence and Lippitt gave plenty of water to the rats but stopped feeding them for a while. So the rats from thirsty became hungry. This reduces the value of the water and increases the value of the food from the point of view of the rat. The question is whether the rats that have been trained with food in the right arm of the maze would switch from going left where they could find water that at this point they did not want to going right where they could expect to find food that they now want. If they had formed the mental map of the maze that included the presence of the food in the right arm, they should definitely do this switch. But Spence and Lippitt found that every single rat in group F continued to go towards the water the first time they were put in the maze hungry. In fact, these rats did not even learn a tiny bit faster than rats in group 0 that had never found food during phase 1. You can see that the two learning curves are exactly parallel. From this, Spence and Lippitt concluded that rats in group F did not learn anything about the location of the food, even if they had performed the action of going right and finding the food many times. In fact, the authors had planned the experiment so that rats in group F had been forced to go right and find the food a number of times. According to these results, it seems hard to argue that Tormann and Onzik rats could learn a mental map of a 14-choice maze, including the location of the food, if Spence and Lippitt's rats couldn't even remember that going right in the very simple maze led to food. In summary, we have discussed two maze experiments in which animals could have learned by simple stimulus response learning driven by reinforcement. This is about the simplest possible account of maze learning. There are many other studies that compare cognitive maps and associative learning, but I'll end our discussion here. I personally have a preference for explanations in terms of associative learning, but I'm open to evidence that this is not enough. This lesson is over. Here are some suggestions on what to study next. The lessons on the box and banana problems and on Aesop's fable experiment are two more lessons on complex learning. The lesson Learning Complex Behavior is about how associative learning may be enough to learn sequences of actions like those needed to solve a maze. If you're interested in what people have found and said in experiments and mazes and about the topic of cognitive maps, you can look at the articles indicated here. Happy learning to everyone!